first thing we're going to do is turn on the um, speaky air that we're going to use to uh, uh, provide oxygen for the flame. And this is the acetylene right here. Okay. And uh, what we're going to do is record the initial ESI. It should never go below 100. Uh, so just to get an idea of usage, we record its pressure at the beginning and then at the end. But this should never go below 500, so it's 1,000 right now. And this one's 250, so we're in good shape. We should record it. So this is the atomic absorption spectrometer. There's a uh, long wedge, and it's essentially where the flame is going to be. It's an elongated flame. And the flame consists of the air and the acetylene that we uh, showed you and uh, the, lame is, the flame is going to be lit and it's going to actually uh, suck up uh, the solution, in this case it's just DI water, uh, but it's going to suck up our sample solutions and calibration solutions into that flame and it'll become um, lead atoms. So okay. we've turned on the computer and uh, we have to turn on the wall switch. This is the switch of the suit yellow tab, and essentially what it does, it starts the fan that takes the exhaust from the flame up to the roof and out. And the machine will not turn on uh, without that. Then we're going to uh, turn on the instrument. You're going to hear a grinding noise soon, and that grinding noise is a good thing. There it is. Okay. What that noise is, is the different wavelengths are uh, accessed through a very fine diffraction, diffraction grating. And this grating essentially was not kind of finding its home place. And that's what the grinding noise was. We've turned on the instrument. It's being warmed up. It's got the gas that it needs. And we're going to start the, uh, start the program. And we're going to pick up a worksheet that we've used before uh, from uh, lead <clears throat> and uh, we're going to use that as our model because a lot of the same settings are there. So we're going to say uh, okay and give it a name. So the name is going to be chem 216 and for example uh, Monday would be the class. Okay and so we say okay. And then as, uh, we get a, um, since this has been a template, we, we get it set up. We're going to change it, and uh, to do that, um, we're going to go to uh, develop. We're going to develop a method. But look here. Since I selected the lead method that existed before, I'm going to open this up, and you can see that one of the lamps is lit, and that's a, a, a lamp that contains uh, lead. So in this lamp, it's sending out um, um, emission from excited lead atoms. So this lamp in it, inside here, has excited lead atoms that are spitting out just the right wavelength uh, for lead atoms only. And it's going through here, it will go through the flame, and if our sample has more or less lead in it, the atoms that are in the uh, flame will absorb that light coming from the lamp and decrease the signal. And that's the basis. Um, while the lamp is warming up, it has to warm up for about, uh, for about five or ten minutes. So we're going to edit the method that was existing. And there are a lot of tabs that you see here. So, yep, we're doing lead. It's in 2% nitric acid because we've made our standards that way and our samples uh, uh, were adjusted by adding a nitric acid. We're in a sample manual mode. We're measuring absorption. You can actually measure some elements just by the amount of light that they emit uh, if they're strong emitters. In this case, lead uh, emits uh, emission is not very strong, so we're going to use the lamp and measure the decrease in the light intensity by the detector. So this is our air settling flame. We're going to leave that the same. Uh, in terms of measurement, we're, you can measure it very different ways. And uh, this is perhaps for a more advanced analytical course where we get into it. But there are different ways to 
um, take the data, the absorption over a period of time to get different kinds of averages, we're going to integrate the um, amount of absorption over a certain time period. So we're going to use that. Minimum reading zero. We're going to use some smoothing, again, some advanced techniques. And each measurement is going to take five seconds. So it takes a lot longer to make these samples than it is to actually measure them. And we have a delay of, of, of six seconds. So when you put this into your, into your sample, uh, you have to clear out the old solution and then get the new solution coming in that you're measuring. It. And we're saying we're giving it about six seconds, which should be fine. Uh, we're going to take three replicates, same sample, but we're measuring it three times to get an average. And we're measuring concentration. And a kind of what we call an external calibration technique. We're going to be looking at a, a standard additions method uh, in the next lab that's a little bit different. Uh, in terms of optical, it's a lamp position three. And the wavelength that we're going to be choosing to measure the quantity of the lead atoms is at 217 nanometers. So it's way, way into the, into the, uh, into the ultraviolet. So we can't really see that. And in order to uh, provide um, a kind of a background correction, we have another lamp that you don't see that's internal here, which is a deuterium lamp that puts out a lot of light at around 217 that can compensate for other species that might be also absorbing at 217. So here's where we put our standards. So what standards do we have today? 0.2. 0.5, 1, 2, and 5. So we're not going to do the 10. 30. So that, that's where we put our standard concentration. And in terms of calibration, this says what kind of curve do you want to draw? Is it going to be a linear regression? Is it going to be what kind of fit are you going to use? And we're going to use something that's particularly well fitted to atomic absorption spectrometry, which has a kind of a, uh, it follows Beer's law pretty well, but uh, if the concentration gets too high, uh, the absorption kind of plateaus. And so for this instrument, there's a new kind of a, a parameter called new rational. And we're going to use that. It's going to fit the data for us. So we don't have to actually plot the data. The next is notes. We're going to uh, use a, is just notes if you're doing an experiment to remind you to do this and that. This is a fun feature. This is called the cookbook. And the cookbook for each element that you're looking at, if you zoom in here, can uh, show you that there are different wavelengths that you can analyze lead for. If, you're, if you have a concentration that has a heck of a lot of lead, then you don't need a very intense uh, uh, wavelength. You can use light of less wavelength. So we're going to be using a uh, wavelength of uh, um, where it's the most sensitive. Um, and we expect for 0.2 milligrams per liter, um, uh, for, for 5 milligrams of, um, per liter, an absorption of about 0.2. And that's kind of a good re region to be in. It also tells you what kind of absorbances you add. So if you're analyzing something that um, has, uh, for example, um, a lot of phosphate, it tells you what you can do to you know, get rid of that. But we're just dealing with water and lead sulfate, so it shouldn't be a problem. This is a graph which kind of predicts what your calibration curve will look like. And this is the concentration. Uh, and so if you have absorption about 5 uh, milligrams per liter or 5 ppm, you should get an absorption of 0.2 at this wavelength. QCP, this is quality control, okay? And we talked about this a lot. So it allows you to uh, run a blank every so often just to make sure that the zero is not shifting. So I've, I've clicked that on, and um, I, it's a note to self that the blank should not be higher than 0.1. Otherwise, I'll get an error message. So that's a good thing. And every so often, we're going to do a continuing calibration verification. And that's going to be at one milligram per liter. So we'll run this one every so often to make sure we get a reading of one 
part per million. Okay, so that's another quality control. And if it's between if it's between 80 and 120 percent of uh, one, it'll say have a good day. That's a good number. If it's out of that, it'll say, it'll put a flag up and say you're out of the spec. And I've told it just to continue. If you're a, a, a lab uh, that's doing commercial work, you would stop the process, and make sure you're in spec. But I think we're going to be okay. The lamp is warmed up. Now what we're going to do is we're going to put labels. So these are the samples that we're going to be running. And so the sample we're going to be running is the sample that you will have prepared um, from uh, your precipitated uh, lead sulfate. Okay? So we would have uh, different initials. We would have maybe MB, we would have K, A, B, okay? All of the, all of the teams in, in the lab. Notice here I have a continuing calibration, but I for this particular, <coughs> let me see, B, notice it turns red, and CCV. So now we've put in the samples, we've put in the calibration, and now we go to analysis. So one of the things we want to do is we want to indicate where we're going to be taking the data. So we go to select, um, and we want to erase those that we're not doing and come back so that will be the, the uh, samples that we're looking at here. Now we have to optimize the uh, lamp now that it's been started and um, so we say okay and you hear the machine makes a little dinging sound that's the monochromator, which is coming into the wavelength. Down here, you can see peaking at lead 217. That's the most sensitive uh, wavelength for the lead. Click Optimize uh, Lamps. OK, and if you see over here, we have some green bars, which indicates the intensity of the light. Uh, this is the um, HC light, which stands for hollow cathode lamp. That's the type of lamp that we have here, hollow cathode lamps. Notice there are slots for other elements too, so if you have a sample that has a number of elements, you can do them with the same sample. You can add it is essentially excited lead atoms. That's what they look mm -hmm. like. And that light is then going out through the monochromator. You can see right over here. Okay, and then it's directed right through here. And part of this setup is to make sure that you have that lamp uh, kind of set up parallel. So if you take a look over my shoulder, you see this, this, this card has a target area and you put, this is right where the slot is and uh, you put it right over there and you want to make sure that as you go back and forth, it's, it's essentially. Now why would you say, why would it be changed? Well, there's a little handle here. If you're dealing with two high concentration, you don't want much absorption. You can you can actually go through the through the flame at an angle and get less absorption. So it's very versatile. Uh, this is a knob that lets you go up and down and uh, sideways to fine tune the position of the flame. Well, now I'm going to take this. Now that I've got the position right, this here. This is a shield. Over here, <coughs> these lamps are putting out high intensity UV light, but this is glass which absorbs those. The very end of those tubes essentially are quartz and will pass the UV light, but it's okay, safe to look at the lamps but not the flame. And one of the things to note is the gain down here. You'll write that in your notebook. Uh, the uh, gain should be um, recorded because it represents the amount of amplification the electronics are doing. As the gain goes higher and higher, it means the lamp is getting weaker and weaker. So you want to monitor that. So um, essentially optimize uh, lamps. Notice that these two uh, bars here are about the same height. That is desirable. We're going to find say, lamps. And we say, OK. 
Okay. 